In this video, I want to provide an introduction to inverse transform sampling. So, like rejection sampling, this is a way of generating independent samples from a given probability density. And the introduction of this other sampling method, at least in the order that I'm introducing it here, is motivated by the fact that we actually found that rejection sampling was very inefficient. In other words, we rejected a large proportion of our points and only accepted very few of them. Unlike rejection sampling, inverse transform sampling is 100% efficient. For each of our points, we accept that point as a sample with probability 1. And like rejection sampling, I'm going to use an example to illustrate how inverse transform sampling works. And I'm going to use the example where we are trying to sample from an exponential distribution with rate parameter 1. So on the left hand side here, I've drawn the PDF for our exponential random variable. So it's a sort of downward sloping line. And on the right, what I've drawn here is something which is known as the CDF. And the CDF stands for the cumulative distribution function. What does the cumulative distribution function actually mean? it's best to illustrate this by means of an example. So imagine that we want to work out the CDF value for an X value of two. Well, to work out the CDF value, what we do is we take our given X value, so two here, say, then what we do is we draw a line up from two, and then we work out the area to the left of that point under the curve. And whatever that area is, I think it's something like 0 0.7, that corresponds to the CDF value at 2. So here, if I mark on here 2, and I draw a line up from 2, then that should meet our CDF curve at a value of about 0 0.7. So strictly the way in which we're working out the CDF value at 2 is that we are integrating the PDF between 0 and 2, so integrating P of x between 0 and 2, with respect to x. More generally, to work out the CDF for any x value, what we do is we just replace our 2 here with x, so we integrate between 0 and x, and I'm going to use a dummy variable x prime here because we're integrating with respect to it, but the idea is exactly the same as that above. Basically, for any x value, what we are doing is we are finding the area under the curve to the left of that point. So when we select an x value of 0, we get out a 0 value for our CDF because to the left of 0, there is no area under the curve. And then if we pick a very high value of x, then the area underneath our curve is going to be very close to 1. And that's exactly what we find over here on the right. So why am I telling us this about the CDF? Well, it turns out that inverse transform sampling actually requires us to know the CDF. In fact, it requires us to know one step further than that, which is known as the inverse CDF. And the inverse CDF is basically just this right-hand graph, but flipped. So the idea here is that what we're trying to do is we want a function that takes us from somewhere between 0 and 1 in our vertical axis here and outputs a given x value. So for example, we might want to know what x value corresponds to a CDF of a half, and here we can sort of just guess what that would roughly be. It turns out to be some number that is pretty close to 1. I think it's about 0 0.7. And we could get that here just from knowing the curve. But what we would like is we would like a mathematical function that enables us to go from the vertical axis to the horizontal axis. To work out that function, we first of all work out the CDF. So we can work out the CDF for our exponential distribution by just substituting in the analytic form of the PDF. So what we do here is we're going to integrate between 0 and x the PDF which corresponds to a rate parameter of 1, that's just e to the minus x integrated with respect to x, and both of these should actually be x prime. If I do that integral, what I find here is that I'm trying to work out the value of minus e to the minus x primed between x and 0, which you can work out is just being equal to 1 minus e to the minus x. How do we work out the inverse CDF? Well, the idea is that what we'd like is we'd like to go from some number, which I'm going to call u, which is equal to 1 
minus e to the minus x, and we want to rearrange this to get an expression for x. So we can do this in stages. We find that e to the minus x is equal to 1 minus u. If I take the log of both sides, I then just get minus x equals log. So log here is the natural log of 1 minus u, and hence we get a relationship that x is equal to minus log of 1 minus u. And so our inverse CDF in this example for a particular value of u is just equal to minus log of 1 minus u. So now that we have our inverse CDF function, we can define what inverse transform sampling actually is. So the idea is that in each iteration of the algorithm, and I'm going to call i here to correspond to a given iteration, we first of all sample a value of u from a uniform distribution between 0 and 1. We then use that u value to calculate, using our inverse CDF, a corresponding value of x. And it turns out that this x will actually be distributed as the distribution that we were trying to sample from in the first place. So if I use xi is equal to minus log of 1 minus ui, then we get out an xi which is exponentially distributed with a rate parameter of 1. You can prove that inverse transform sampling, this technique here that we've introduced, actually does result in x's being independently sampled from the distribution of interest. But I don't want to go ahead and prove it, I'd just rather provide some intuition for how the algorithm works. So now I want to provide some simulations in Mathematica to demonstrate how inverse transform sampling actually works. And so on the bottom axis here, I've got the sample number, in other words, the iteration of our algorithm. And on the y-axis here, or the vertical axis rather, I've got the corresponding x value for that particular iteration. And what I'm showing here is firstly, in blue, the u value that we sample. So that u value is always going to be between 0 and 1 because we're uniformly sampling between 0 and 1. And then I'm showing how far that point is moved when we apply the inverse CDF function to that u value. And so what you're going to see is that the points which are very near zero correspond to an inverse CDF value which is also very close to zero. In our right graph that we showed before, these points are basically towards the origin, so in that sort of region of the graph, a low value of our u corresponds to a low value of x, and as the u value that we sample get closer to 1, the distance which the points moved are much longer. And that's because when we get a CDF, which is, let's say, 0 0.999, then the corresponding x value that would have generated that CDF corresponds to a very high value of x. And so we move the point that much further. So now I'm going to run this for a few iterations, and hopefully you can kind of see how this process is working. So you can see that these points here were, and especially this point here, were very close to 1, hence they got moved a long sort of distance. Whereas these other points here in the, in the bottom, they corresponded to much lower values that we were sampling from our u value, and hence they got moved much less far. So now if I illustrate this but for a much larger sample, hopefully you can start to build up a picture in your mind as to what the distribution of the x values, in other words these sort of orange crosses that we simulate, actually would look like in practice. And so if I kind of stop that somewhere towards the end, we can see that most of the orange points lie towards low values of x, because most of the points of our graph actually are in the bottom. It may be a bit hard to see them. And then we're getting a few points which are further out. And so we can kind of see that we're going to have a concentration of samples which is going to be sort of declining. And it turns out that the rate at which it's declining is an exponential function. And it corresponds exactly to our exponential PDF. And if we run our sampler for much longer, now I've run it for a thousand iterations, we can actually see this. On the left hand side, I've got all of our samples, both the blue, the u values which we sample uniformly between 0 and 1, and perhaps a bit small to see, but the orange crosses which correspond to each of those u values. And you can see that the distribution of the orange crosses corresponds quite well to an exponential distribution. It's kind of downwardly sloping away from zero. One thing that I want to stress about inverse transform sampling 
is that each of these orange crosses is generated from one sample for you. In other words, we are not rejecting any of our samples. We've got 100% efficiency with inverse transform sampling. So in a way, it's an improvement on rejection sampling. But like many things in life, there is no free lunch. So what are some of the problems with inverse transform sampling? Well, one of the things that it requires is that we know the CDF. We need the CDF to be able to generate the inverse CDF. For many problems, that's just not possible. We just don't know an analytic form or a good approximation to the inverse CDF. Another issue with inverse transform sampling is that it doesn't work with unnormalized entities. We need that normalization to allow us to work out the CDF and inverse CDFs. So in a way, rejection sampling is slightly more relaxed on that front because we can actually sample from unnormalized entities using it. Perhaps the most important issue with inverse transform sampling, which is most important for Bayesian statistics anyway, is that this method doesn't generalize well to higher dimensional problems. In higher dimensions, it's very difficult to actually work out a analytic or an approximate form of the CDF. And hence, inverse transform sampling tends to be used in univariate or at least problems with relatively few dimensions. Also, just remembering what I said before about the fact that this technique only works with normalized densities, remember that in Bayesian statistics, we aren't dealing with a normalized density. We're dealing with the numerator of the posterior. That's the reason that we're doing sampling in the first place. So whilst inverse transform sampling can be really useful, it's not necessarily going to be that useful in Bayesian statistics, at least when we deal with models of a modest level of complexity.